to be here and what a gorgeous day it is and uh, it's just great to be here in Utah and my name is uh, James Campbell I'm with Rocky Mountain Power uh, legislative policy advisor uh, I've been with Rocky Mountain Power since about 2007 prior to that I was at the Utah Division of Air Quality where I worked on Governor Huntsman's Blue Ribbon Advisory Council for Climate Change. Uh, I led the Renewable Energy Initiative as part of that. So as I was thinking about this panel and thinking about where we were 10 and 12 years ago, it was real, it's really interesting and, and exciting to see how much we've progressed and how much, how much uh, both in, in net zero uh, and also Rocky Mountain Power. It's been fun to see really a transformation within the utility and the community. And when I first joined in 2007, Rocky Mountain Power had on its planning three coal plants. We were gonna build three coal plants and it was on our, our integrated resource plan. And the company made a very bold move and just removed those. Uh, there was a, uh, much to the chagrin of our regulators, it was not happy with a lot of the folks in uh, some of our other states really wanted us to you know, pursue the, this path we were down, but we saw that times were changing and the economics were, were different. There was some uncertainty with uh, carbon regulation, and so the company really made a bold, bold move to move out of the traditional way and really start embracing energy efficiency, embracing renewable energy, and in a sense uh, built uh, billions, spent billions of dollars worth of renewable energy and when I started, our, compared to where we are, our uh, carbon emissions in what's delivered to our customers has dropped by about 40%. So in 10 years, you've seen a very precipitous reduction. We've also seen, uh, uh, Mapper, we've built out a really robust energy efficiency program. And we really are among the leaders in the country, and we have fantastic experts in energy efficiency. So we do have a booth downstairs, so I would suggest uh, if you wanna, wanna get some information, please go and, and visit with those folks because they really are truly experts in this, in this area. And, and, and another big change that, that we've really embraced is, is what, what do our customers want? And, and how can we partner with, with our customers and really get them what they want? Uh, I, I'm excited there is a project, and I think uh, uh, Chris Parker, I don't know if he's here, but he's going to be speaking later this afternoon as a project, the Give Development, Give Group. And that's just a fantastic development where the, you know, they, they wanted to address uh, air quality, local air quality, and they wanted to uh, increase the amount of renewable energy. And so we worked with them in how to, how to build an all-electric building to really get rid of, because if you look at our local air quality, where is it challenges? Where does it come from? It comes from cars, the millions of cars driving around the road, the combustion engines there, and the millions of little furn uh, furnaces and water heaters in people's homes. Those are the primary cause. And so if we can now, as builders and designers and policy makers, if there's things we can do to how do we get beyond that and how do we move? And, and net zero really is one of those, those main approaches where we can, how do we get the community and design the community we want. And that's something that we're committed to. And so are these fantastic leaders here and speaking about uh, designing and building incredible communities. So I'm really excited for this panel and I'm excited to, uh, to invite them. And so uh, first off we have, I'll just go through and introduce all of them. We have uh, Mayor Jackie Biskupski who more than 25 years ago, Jackie visited Utah on a ski trip and never left. <laughs> like so many people, she fell in love with Salt Lake City and all it offers. Uh, Jackie holds a degree in criminal justice from Arizona State University and once owned a private investigative firm. So that's, uh, make sure corporate you- Corporate fraud. <laughs> <laughs> and Not in affairs, corporate fraud. <laughs> That's right, the worst form of welfare. Uh, in 1998, Jackie was elected to the Utah House of Representatives, where she served 13 years as the first openly gay elected official in Utah. Woohoo! Yeah. Um, and before becoming mayor of Salt Lake City, Jackie worked for eight years in the Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office. Jackie was elected as Salt Lake City's 35th mayor in 2015 and was sworn in January 4th, 2016. So, uh, 
welcome uh, Mayor Biskupski. Thank you. Next to her is uh, Mayor Andy Bierman. Uh, Andy is a native of Columbus, Ohio, home of the Ohio State University. <laughs> no, I, I, that's my, uh, he, he, uh, but he, he spent his summers in uh, Northern Michigan and graduated from Miami of Ohio University. So I apologize for the, uh, the Buckeye uh, shout out. With, a, with a, a Bachelor of Philosophy, he has been an instructor for the National Outdoor Leadership School, or Knowles. In 1998, Andy and his wife acquired and renovated the Treasure Mountain Inn, transforming it into a modern and eco-friendly hotel. Andy is a lifelong environmental advocate and was co-recipient of the 2010 Park City Environmental Hero Award. He served as, as president of the historic Park City Business Alliance. He was elected to the Park City Council in January 2012 and elected mayor in January 2017. Let's welcome uh, Mayor Bierman. <laughs> and next to him is uh, the Summit County Council Chair, Chairwoman Kim Carson. Kim graduated cum laude from the University of Utah in organizational communications and has a background in corporate sales and training. Kim was the executive director of the Park City Education Foundation and then was elected to the Park City Board of Education for two terms. She is vice chair of the Council of Governments and serves on the Utah Association of Counties Boards of Directors. She is also involved in the Summit County Board of Health Kim was first elected to the Summit County Council in 2012 and is now in her second term and serves as chair. Welcome, uh, Councilwoman <laughs> Carson. And our southern representative from the state, we have the mayor of Moab, Emily Niehaus. Emily Niehaus is the founder and executive director of Community Rebuilds a Moab-based nonprofit building affordable, energy-efficient housing through a workforce training program. She holds a master's degree in applied sociology from Clemson University and has worked in Moab as a social worker, a loan officer, and a bookkeeper. <laughs> she was elected as Moab City's mayor in 2017 and took office beginning January 2018. Welcome, Mayor uh, Niehaus. Well, as we begin, all four of you are clearly leaders in renewable energy and sustainability and have really helped kind of push the envelope out. Why don't, this is a question for all of you. And, um, and think about, why don't you tell us what inspired you to make sustainability a personal priority uh, when you first became either mayor or, or joined the council? Uh, mayor, excuse me, why don't we start with you? Sure, so um, I think everyone here knows that the number one issue uh, in this city and across uh, the Wasatch Front certainly is clean air. Uh, we really had no one actually um, moving the needle on how we're going to clear our air and the steps, the actual steps that we need to take to do that work. Um, and. Uh, when I came into office, um, I met with my, uh, at the time, my Division of Sustainability uh, Director, Vicki Bennett, who is now our Department Director and is here today, but talked to her about what really needs to happen if we're going to clear our air, like what is the work that has to get done. And, um, you know, we set the course for um, working with Rocky Mountain Power um, and had the good fortune of a new CEO being appointed to Rocky Mountain Power um, in 2015 during my campaign and uh, having an opportunity to sit down and get to know Cindy Crane on an individual level as well as professionally and talk to her about how people feel like they just cannot breathe. That is, the air has got to get fixed. And in our discussions, what, 
what we talked about was how our air quality problem is the same problem that is creating climate change and that there is opportunity to work together. Um, she was clear it wouldn't be easy to get to the goals that I was putting on the table for her to consider, but she also said it wasn't impossible and that we would have to work together and the city would have to do its part. And over the coming months, uh, we brokered an unprecedented franchise agreement that will take Salt Lake City to 100% renewable energy by 2032. And that will help us clear the air. But it also helped my colleagues here find a path forward to do their part and sign on to similar agreements. So we're very grateful for that work that my team and I did uh, with Rocky Mountain Power um, and in a collaborative way to really create some impacts that will help clear our air. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's also an example of uh, what would the world be like if it was run by women with two great leaders like uh, you, Mayor Viskowski, and my boss, uh, Cindy Crane. So, or our uh, strong allies. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Mayor Bierman, uh, kind of same question for you. What, 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 what has inspired you, and, and especially when you first now have come into office? And what I'd actually like to talk about what inspired my community. Cause sure. I, I've always been inspired. I've been a lifelong environmental advocate, and it's what I studied in college. I worked as an outdoor educator, and I largely ran for office to push an environmental agenda. However, you learn sometimes when you're elected that if the community isn't there and your peers on council aren't there, it's, it's hard to make progress. And my first term was challenging and that we made incremental progress, but I didn't feel like it happened at the speed that the planet needed it. In my final year, I was approached by uh, one of our younger residents who was very pro-environment, and he came up to me and he said, you need to do something. And I said, I can't do something by myself, so I need your help. And I told him to go gather his friends. He had grown up in Park City and gather, gather his colleagues and, and start approaching the council and put pressure on us because the will wasn't there. And he did exactly that. He put together a group I, I nicknamed the Carbon Army, and they showed up. <laughs> for three months to every council meeting. Most of them were millennials, although the, there were a number of um, assistants from all ages that showed up, and they demanded action by the council, particularly the young ones. They showed up with their young children, and they said, we've enjoyed wonderful snow here. We want our kids to see that same snow. We want Park City to show a leadership role. And at the end of it, we went from a council that was lukewarm on the idea to um, agreeing to some of the most ambitious climate goals of any town in the country. By uh, 2022, we intend to have a completely net zero uh, footprint for our city, and by 2032, we want it to be community-wide. So we created a group of empowered citizens. They continued their involvement. It empowered our council, and we're very excited to work with our regional partners now, um, of which are sitting at the table here, and Rocky Mountain Power has played a key role as well, and, and we think we can make a difference. Oh, that's great. That's a, that's a great example of how individuals really can make a difference and, and really help move things forward. And it's great that you were, you were able to be part of that as well. Uh, Chairwoman Carson, why don't, you, uh, why don't you tell us what's inspired you? Um, you know, my awareness of environmental issues really goes back to, I'm another Buckeye, and we found out last <laughs> night that Emily is also a Buckeye, so go figure. Um, but I had an older brother that was studying environmental studies in the late 60s, and I had the opportunity to spend a couple weeks with him one summer while he was doing an internship at um, an organic farm in central Ohio. And that became the, the first time I was really aware that there was another way of doing things and we need to take care of our environment. And um, then when I was on the Park City Board of Education, we were looking at doing some remodel work. We had had some past remodels that weren't that effective. We had um, what some people felt were some sick buildings. And when we went to redesign the Park City High School, we had a team of about 25 community members. And I know for all you architects out there, that's probably nothing could be worse than a committee that size that you have to work with on a project like that. Um, but we all came together, and <clears throat> one of our 
main goals was to create something that was going to be a very healthy um, environment for the kids that really was conducive to learning. And I think we did that, and it ended up being the first LEED certified building within the Park City limits. And I'm proud of that, and proud of the community, because again, like Andy said, it was the community coming together. And then when I came on council, I think it was just everything that we did, we wanted to look at how could we do it better and more efficiently. If you can institute sustainable um, practices and whatever you do, you're going to end up saving money in the long run. And especially within counties, um, resources are really tight and we're always looking at our capacity to do things. So if we can look at a long-term return on investment or hopefully a shorter term return on, a, uh, on investment, then that's gonna mean we can do even more in the future. So, and it takes other council members. Um, Glenn Wright, where are you? There's Glenn. He's a fellow council member and he's been incredibly supportive since he joined the board a couple years ago and has been working diligently on things like um, forest health, watershed protection, looking at biofuels, how can we have a win-win with doing some timber harvesting but yet have a good outcome from um, that work. And then partners like Lisa Yoder, our staff, they're all incredibly supportive of this initiative and Lisa's up there in the audience also. And then Cheryl Butler, who's here, is a community member that's involved with Habitat for Humanity and they're looking at ways to build more efficient homes in the future and net zero, with net zero capacity. So again, it takes that support community-wide and with the people you're working directly with. And I'm pleased with what the goals that we've set and where we're going, but it's also exciting to know that, we, you know, how much more that we can accomplish. Great, thank you. And I'll know next time if you ever ask me to be on a committee to join it, because it'll be actually productive. So. <laughs> <laughs> so Mayor uh, Niehaus, why don't you uh, tell us what, what's inspired you? Um, so I'm one of you. I'm a developer and a builder. Um, and have you ever sat with uh, a building official or a local representative, um, or even uh, been on the phone with the Department of Professional Licensing and thought, man, I wish I could change that. That's what actually inspired me to run uh, for mayor of Moab. I wanted to be on the other side of the desk and I wanted to confront um, the policy walls that I was hitting as an environmental and affordable housing developer. Um, I wanted to be part of the solution. I was so lucky. Uh, Moab, the stage had already been set for me, honestly, um, as a representative of my community. We had already passed on Valentine's Day, the year before I was elected, um, the goal to hit 100% um, renewable by 2032. Um, we also just recently passed a, a ban on plastic bags for all retailers. And so we've been doing um, really cool stuff, every, everything in between um, on, a, on, a, on a scale, on a local scale. Um, so again, it was a really easy place to land, um, uh, being um, uh, pro-environmental. Um, but from you know, being a builder, um, and back to this policy wall, um, I, I not just wanted to uh, be a part of the solution to, to disable some barriers for building affordable housing and, um, and uh, achieving energy efficiency, but I wanted to um, work on developing more carrots for all of us. So um, it's one thing to put it on our website. Um, it's one thing to um, get um, you know, good press, good marketing from our efforts. Um, it feels good when we're sitting at our tables at night with our family thinking, we're, we're creating a better environment, but um, how can we look to local, state, and federal um, uh, agencies and say, um, give, you know, reward us, reward us um, in different ways. So um, I, I'm really encouraged by all of the doors that have already opened for me 
sitting here with all of you is a door. Um, I'm going to Washington, D.C. tonight, um, invited to the, to the White House as a female mayor. It's another door. Um, and it's really exciting to be able to sit with people and talk about net zero energy. It's, um, it's just a great conversation for us to have. And, I'm, and I um, have just got one plug for all of you. Um, I would like for you to consider running for planning commission or council. Um, consider public service. Um, because the more of us that are serving within our communities and putting forward uh, this agenda, the, the faster we're going to move the needle. So, um, you know, not to, not to uh, give you more work, because I know pulling a permit is like, you know, getting a miracle um, <laughs> or finishing a set of building plans. But, uh, but it is important um, that we don't just um, sit back and allow, um, you know, people to make decisions for us and then we respond to them on the other side of the desk. We've got to be part of the solution and I encourage you to politically participate too. Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad to, that you're going to DC and, I, and I'm sure you're going to be a, a breath of fresh air and bring a perspective that will be good for the, for the White House to hear. So, mm -hmm. so uh, good for you and good for us, for you representing for all of us. So, uh, Mayor Biskupski, you, you currently are the chair for, on the committee for the Sustainable Future Committee yes. as part of the, the Conference of Cities of Mayors. Yeah, the U.S. Conference. Yeah, so why, why don't you tell us about that role and, and where you see some of the future trends that are happening in sustainability, in particular with cities? Sure. So, um, just this year, I was appointed to be the chair of the... Uh, Mayors for a Sustainable Future by my colleagues across this country. Um, and it's a real honor to be leading the discussions around sustainability. And I know I wouldn't be in that role if it wasn't for my team, which Vicki and Tyler play a significant role in. Um, we have tremendous depth of expertise uh, in Salt Lake City government and uh, we've been doing trainings for other communities on the work that we do and, and uh, because they don't have sustainability members on their teams. Um, but we also are leaders. You know, Salt Lake City is used to being a leader. We're that little blue dot in the red state and um, we have to lead on many things in order for um, the state as a whole to evolve. And that, you know, is, um, I think, s something that not only um, we know here, but mayors across the country have always watched what Salt Lake City is doing compared to the state. And um, as a leader, um, I am bold and I work very hard. I have surrounded myself with very competent leaders to uh, be my cabinet members and run my different departments. Uh, we are a very effective and efficient team. And I think that um, is part of why I am leading so quickly for the US Conference of Mayors. Um, we have very little time to get this work done um, our carbon emissions output in the world must peak in 2020, 2020. And then it has to start a steady decline from there. And that means we have to work fast and feverishly. We have to partner. We have to create innovative ways. As the chair, I take um, uh, input, we survey mayors um, all across this country from mayors of a town of 9,000 to, to New York City are mayors that have filled out surveys about the work they are doing. We use uh, that information to share best practices with mayors at different conferences. Um, and we also continue to work globally, so as a leading mayor in the country on climate change, I'm, 
uh, one that it was number 16 to sign on to 100% renewable by 2032. Um, what I do is not being done at the federal level. And so it is my job to keep this country moving forward, to bring other mayors into the fold, to help them understand their path and what is possible. We now have over 80 communities in this country who are on track to do 100% renewable energy by 2032, four of the 80 communities sitting here today. And I think that says a lot about Utah and how we partner and collaborate and use our experts that are here um, and how I lead as a leader, knowing that um, I need the expertise in order for us to affect change and I need to share that expertise. So, um, I'm very grateful for the role that I play, um, and I know my team works extra hard because I lead this climate conversation in this country with a handful of other mayors, uh, but we all know the work is worth doing, and we're proud to be doing it, um, and we're, we're excited to see how many other communities. We now have 400 mayors in the country. Remember, I was number 16. 400 in the country that have said we will live up to the Paris Climate Agreement and and 80 different communities have figured out how to get to renewable and we will continue to build those numbers year after year to make sure all of those mayors can get to renewable by 2032. Wow, that's, that's great. And it's really interesting right now with what's happening in, in Washington and the dysfunction that's going yeah. on. And it's just really great to see your leadership and at the mayors. Do, do, do you see the same kind of dysfunction when you're talking with your, your other mayors that are even from other, no. other parties? Mm -mm. And you know, the mayors, we're all living the impacts of climate change. We all are. Uh, I've had multiple fires in our city. Mm -hmm. In fact, this state has probably had more fires than any other state this year. Uh, we know we're drying up. I know that in my watershed, I, I have the responsibility of delivering water to over a million people in this, in this county. And we know that we've lost five weeks of snowpack over the last 20 years. That is a lot of snow, that is a lot of water. That is our reservoir. So for me uh, and all the other mayors who are feeling these impacts, it doesn't matter what party we are affiliated with, none of us care. Uh, we are working feverishly to help one another survive during this window, but also affect change and adapt to the change we have to live in today. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, Mayor Bierman, you know, I was just reading about in Los Angeles how they're, they're applying for the Summer Olympics and some of the really uh, aggressive uh, targets they had, especially with electric transportation, really some progressive programs and innovative programs that they're looking at. I know that Utah is, is, it has submitted a proposal for the Olympics and you're part of that, that effort. Can, can you talk about some of the innovative strategies and, and approaches that, that you're looking at doing to achieve some of the carbon and renewable goals we've been talking about? Yeah, I'd love to talk about the Olympics, but first I want to <laughs> piggyback a little bit on uh, Mayor Biskupski and her leadership among the uh, national mayors, because I, I think this is, this is an important point where on a national level, the federal government has decided to make the environment a partisan issue, mm -hmm. and, and therefore it has bogged down with many other issues, and we're making no progress, so we can no longer rely on the federal government to solve these issues. State to state, it hasn't been an emphasis for most states, so it really falls on local communities. And, and it's, it's a very empowering time for us, but it's a time that we need to act. And I think taking that leadership on a grassroots level, we can get to the same place. And it's incumbent upon us to do that right now. So I, 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 I give the mayor a lot of credit for stepping up there and inspiring other mayors, because I think that's the only way it's going to get done in the time we have. 
But as far as the Olympics go, the Olympics have a, a mixed reputation. We all love the sport of it, but the last number of games we've seen, a lot of corruption, a lot of environmental devastation, it's going into petrostates. It's got a bit of a reputation for being corporate. And um, I think hosting them here in Salt Lake and in Utah, we have a chance to reboot the games and take them back to the spirit of the sport. But the part that excites me the most is I think we can do the first net zero, compact, sustainable games. We have a great opportunity to further a lot of the efforts we're already doing in our communities now. Um, we have both Salt Lake and Park City and Summit County all trying to be 100% renewable by then. So that's an easy box to check. But on top of that, we're electrifying our fleets. We have, um, we have electric buses. We're planning on um, pushing that out into electric plows and police cars and such. Uh, uh, net zero facilities is something. We've made it standard policy in Park City. Every city facility we build at this point is going to be net zero, and I think there's probably similar plans among my peers here. So that's all setting us up to serve as an example of the world that we can host a games, and we've already shown we can successfully host a great Olympic Games, but the question is can we do one that has minimal impact upon the planet and reboot that model so the games move away from this corporate model that's so destructive to where they're hosted. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's that's well put. And are are you, are you seeing as 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 you're moving the some of these strategies out into your organization? Is there any pushback? I mean, because there's I know that it's always tough when any you want to change any kind of organization. It, it's always a, a challenge. Can you can you? Talk yeah, there was it? a tremendous amount of pushback when we when when our council set the the net zero goals. The the staff pleaded with us that it was too aggressive and and we needed to uh, to uh, give longer time frames. But we felt and it was critical that these be uh, goals that happen within our generation. So it can't be something that we can push off and say, oh, the next council will figure that out. We'll be aspirational today, and it's their problem. And it turns out, I think you know, I'm going to put Luke and Celia, two of my. Uh, stars in our sustainability department on, on the spot here, but I think we're going to beat those goals. Um, and something as simple as the electric buses, that was, we had a fairly epic battle with our, our uh, transit head who, they want solid state. The last thing they want to see is an electric bus broken down along the side of the road. And, and there was a lot of fighting that, to, to adopt something that early on and that cutting edge. It turns out um, that, that it's been uh, far more reliable than the mechanical buses. I think there's like 18 parts in the drivetrain of an electric bus as opposed to hundreds in a, in a standard bus. And um, we hope that by hosting those, I've been told that we have larger cities, LA being one of them, future home of the games that has come and looked at Park City's program and they've decided to embrace electric vehicles instead of natural gas where they were headed. So we're happy we can serve as an example, but it, it does come with a, a lot of back and forth because in, in government, you want to be reliable and, and to, to be out there on the edge, you take some risks. Well, you, you clearly are uh, innovating out there, and definitely kudos to you and, and your, your staff that you, uh, I've worked with them, they are fantastic, and, and it, it truly are leaders in the country for some of these innovative uh, strategies. Uh, Councilwoman Carson, you know, one thing that I'm struck about is as being in, in an organization and you have a lot of these goals and, and you have these plans and all that stuff, but, but what can really the individual, whether it's um, uh, an employee in your, in your county or even just a citizen in your county, what can they really do to help facilitate and bring some of these goals to fruition? Well, first, I think it's important for us to lead by example. And we have, I know, three council members that have electric vehicles, or two have them, and one is waiting for one. Um, we're already talking about fighting over the chargers when we go to our buildings. <laughs> um, and we try to make it easy for our, both our employees and our citizens to join us in this. So Andy talked about the electric buses. Um, that's been incredibly successful, and our usage is way over what we had anticipated. Um, we have an electric bike program, the first all-electric bike share in the country, and that's been very successful, too, and we have um, more demand for more stations. Um, and the, both the locals and our tourists are getting involved in that. 
um, we're doing upgrades in each building. So every employee is seeing the results firsthand of LED lighting, we're adding solar as we have funding available, and I want to thank Rocky Mountain Power for the partnership in that program, and also on the EV chargers. We have um, four regular EV chargers and two of the fast chargers in the county, and we're looking at expanding that, you know, again, as funds um, allow. So those are just some of the ways. Um, we're also trying to do code changes, and you mentioned that, how hard it is, but it takes situations like this where we learn more, and it's so important that you come to us and tell us really what you need because we're not, most of us anyways, aren't in the business. And so I really ask you to let us know of, you know, last night at dinner we were talking about stretch ordinances. And we've done a few things to incentivize, like um, helping to support solar by reducing um, the cost of permitting. And we want to continue to be able to do things like that. We're doing a lot of um, outreach to the community through Summit Community Power Works. Um, right now we have a challenge going on where people can sign up, find out how they can make improvements in their home, you know, post it on the website and get a little competition going in the community. Um, we had a great program a couple of years ago where we had education in each of the elementary schools um, with, throughout the county and all three school districts. Kids got to take LED light bulbs home. They were going home and telling their parents why it was so important for them to change out the light bulbs. And we were able to go into um, our, some of our communities where we have affordable housing and go in and do a complete switch out for them. And that was made possible through help from Rocky Mountain Power and Mountain Lands Community Housing Trust. And we also were able to go in and do that for seniors. So it's programs like that that our, our staff gets involved in. They get excited about it. They do it at home. They share it with their neighbors. And um, we just hope that continues, trickle down. Yeah, no, that's great. And, um, mm -hmm. and I know my son appreciates uh, some of the, we're talking about changing out the light bulbs. It's, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it, it's funny to, um, with, with children, how so much more dedicated they are and committed to uh, the sustainability and the environment. You know, I would leave my house, leave a light on, when we go and leave, it's like, what are you doing? Why are you know, like, well, for security, like, well, you're wasteful. <laughs> so, so it's interesting. So if we can get that message out, that, that's, uh, that's great that, that, that you're doing we that. We do hope that, you know, it's unfortunate that they're also testing out the um, electric bikes because, you know, when they're jumping curves with them and going off trail and things, it's, it's a little tough on them. So we're trying to figure out how to curb that. So if you're a parent in Park City, please implore your children to not ride the electric bike. They're not supposed to ride them anyway. She's supposed to be 18 or older. So. Well, well, thank you. Um, Mayor Niehaus, uh, you know, social equity is, is really kind of the missing leg of sustainability. It really gets kind of lost when we're talking about sustainability. Can, can, can you, you, you bring some perspective to that, like how we, as we have passion for net zero, but how do we still remember to include that kind of human dimension of it, and how do we keep a, a social equity? Uh, okay, so I've got to say that I responded, I had interesting responses to your slide, Sam, because um, the slide that showed uh, our movement toward robotics, um, made me nervous. Um, we've got a resource um, that I think is um, uh, bigger than solar, and that is our young emerging professionals, our millennials. Your slides were so awesome because they really hit on the changing trends in how we look at housing. And all of us here, um, are uh, deciders on the built environment. And so understanding what tomorrow's client really looks like is critical. And um, you said, and it's true, that um, the next generation is less concerned about um, a bigger home. Um, they're straddled with student debt. 
they're more concerned about um, social responsibility um, and how that dovetails with our built environment. Um, and so they're, you know, the, what little dollars they have, um, they're gonna spend on innovative uh, design um, and innovative homes. Um, there is a push to go smaller. Um, there is a loud megaphone about density that's coming from the young emerging professionals um, that I hear the 60% still want the single family, but maybe it's a single family attached um, and uh, better use of land. Um, but I'll, So I'll say um, in terms of social equity, that's one piece. Um, what's coming our way uh, from the, the emerging uh, next generation. But also, I figured I would just um, ask everybody here um, if you do not identify with the um, male gender, but you are uh, part of the construction industry, will you stand up? So you're, 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 uh, you're th thank you for being willing to stand up. <laughs> um, but also, um, your leaders um, uh, in your own right. Um, 50% of our population is um, female. And um, I don't know, it depends on what statistic you're looking at, but um, it's a much smaller statistic when we talk about construction in the construction industry. And um, one of those policy walls that I ran into when I was trying to create affordable housing and really didn't know enough to stop um, back when I thought, oh, I'll just build homes. Um, was that um, I hit a barrier with the Department of Professional Licensing. Um, there's uh, licensure requirements in our state that um, indirectly lock women out of, uh, and minorities out of the um, construction trade. So when we think about millennials, it's not just what they want to build, but what they want to do. Um, and uh, the, um, actually the majority of my staff and um, half of the student interns um, of my home building program are female. Um, and it makes a difference um, because it unlocks uh, more people to swing hammers and, and participate in this uh, uh, net zero construction industry. So I just wanted to thank you again for the slides um, pertaining to millennials and what people are really looking to buy because it is net zero homes. Um, so we can not only talk about the product, but we can talk about the process and how we can be more inclusive. Thank you. Mayor Biscus, because we're talking about social equity yeah. and affordable housing, <clears throat> and right now we're experiencing just an incredible shortage and, and a lot of issues associated. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I know that um, uh, our affordable housing plan, uh, which was just finished, um, in the last year, um, has already launched um, and we are achieving uh, 2,000 affordable housing units that will be completed by the end of 2019. And in there um, are a wide variety of incomes from no income to 80% area median income. Um, but we also know that that affordability needs to be on transit routes, um, that we have to up our game on transportation so that people can get out of their cars and get to and from work and have an opportunity that is similar to those of us who have the ability to own a vehicle. Um, but we also know that there are people like Chris Parker from Give Group who are um, not only creating affordable housing models in our city, but sharing the plans with other developers to get them to understand you can build green and affordable and that we should all be doing this work together. And, and he was so adamant about it. That they had big billboard size documents showing how to do the work. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's very important that we work collaboratively with the development community um, and push back a little bit and 
as we build new resource centers, for instance, for those who are experiencing homelessness, the ones in Salt Lake City are, are, have green standards in them. And we, there was a lot of pushback about that, but yet we're, you know, we're building resource centers that need to last for decades. And so we have to do this right the first time. Um, so for our city, uh, equity is at, at the forefront of the work that we are doing. That's why we master planned housing, we master plan transit, we are um, working diligently to try and figure out the first and last mile uh, transportation solutions for people that um, need them and getting very creative with how that works. Yeah, no, that's great. I, you know, with, with, with affordable housing, one of the areas you never really think about as being a challenge of housing is Park City and Summit County. Did you do? Mayor Bierman or, or Chair Wynn, would you like to comment on that? Some of the, the, the challenges you're facing on housing and how to keep it uh, sustainable as well? Certainly. You want to go first? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> well, for us, we, we, we really have four critical priorities in our community. And one of them is housing, the other is transportation, energy, which is also climate, and social equity. And what I've found is you can't separate any of the four. They're all tied closely together, and, and they have to be a consideration. And we, uh, we are losing our middle class in town. We are down to where residents are a, a good minority in town. And so we are trying to figure out how to preserve that. And one of our goals is to build 800 affordable units uh, for our essential service workers, our teachers, our cops, essentially our middle class to keep a vibrant community. But to do those, we need to have good land use planning and figure out how to put those in place for transit because uh, transportation is a big cost. And if you certainly can get away with one or no cars, you're able to afford more. Energy is another big part of that, and efficiency of these properties. We, our plan is to make them all net zero. And one thing I found is when you, as, as we've entered this phase of talking about net zero building or efficient building, there's always critics out there. So if it comes to the council, well, here's one scenario, we'll build them for this cost. Or if we value engineer this, this, and this and take these efficiencies out, it's less expensive. And so we've had to actually shift our mind frame and say, okay, this is like safety standards, fire systems, or ADA standards. It's not open for discussion. We are building every property net zero. And, and, and that takes it sort of out of the political realm. And then it's just a matter of figuring out where you want to build them and how you need to pay for them. So it's been something we're, we're working our way through, but a, a big challenge in our community, because if we don't get it right, there's not gonna be anybody left in town. We'll just be a resort town of second homes. Did you wanna comment? Can I just add something too, that um, uh, when somebody takes out a mortgage, that's when, you, that's when we all know if you can put solar on the mortgage, if you can put gray water systems on the mortgage, or um, you know, net zero, all of the gadgets that go into net zero, energy building, if you can put it on the mortgage, um, then uh, they're more likely to buy. And we need to do a better job in the industry of communicating the um, low, low or no utility payment as part of the full cost to homeowners. Um, and I was saying before, like the carrots, the incentives, we gotta do better to um, look at those as well. Um, but uh, really, we need to do a better job of messaging that affordability um, long term after you put the key in the door, especially when we're building for low and very low income families, because a, cha a fluctuation in um, energy can really, uh, really affect their paycheck or really affect their um, ability to pay for other things yeah. and their stability. Well, we find depending on the circumstance, we may have more control than we do at other times. For instance, if it's a project where we're approving maybe an amendment to a development agreement, we might be able to have more enticements for them to include net zero um, practices. And if it's somebody coming in and they've, they already have the building rights and they're coming in with their plans, we don't have, um, much we can do to really persuade them to build it differently. And I think that's where the education in the community comes in. Yeah. Education with your community, education with our local um, electeds, our state electeds, and yeah. 
I would have loved to have had all the legislature in here for your presentation this morning, <laughs> Sam. And I think, you know, when you talked about San Francisco prices, that's basically what we're facing in Summit County. In fact, I think we have you have that them be. <laughs> Unfortunately so. Yeah. Yeah. So that is a big challenge on how we can try to convince um, the people that we have coming up to the desk that there are a better that there are better ways of doing things. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think as part of that that education, there are uh, resources out there. I know Rocky Mountain Power, we really are trying to be a resource for all of you, all of you mm -hmm. uh, builders and designers and architects mm -hmm. that we can really help to achieve some of these sustainability goals. Well, and, and I do want to mention, we have, through a development agreement, we were able to get over 1,100 not units, but pillows for workforce housing associated with the canyons development. And we're working, I know this is one thing Glenn worked very hard on, was trying to have some sustainability measures built into those. And we're still working on that, but I believe Rocky Mountain Power may be able to assist us there. And we would love to see that, especially with that many units going in. And, you know, it's really an investment in the future and just makes sense. Yeah, well, we can continue this conversation for hours, and, uh, and if, if I wasn't being uh, looked at right now harshly, I would continue <laughs> this uh, for hours. So I just wanted to thank uh, everybody here on the panel, our mayors and uh, councilwoman, for, for taking the time and providing such insight and leadership. I, I really think it, it, leadership, especially in today's political climate, it gets forgotten that when you really do have good leaders, that what a difference things can be, and, and there are examples of that. So thank you all very much. Thank you.